Welcome back to another Ask GMBN Tech. This is our weekly Q&A show where we hopefully get to answer some of your mountain bike technical related questions. Don't forget you can fire them into the email address that's on the screen at the bottom there right now. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech or you can simply add them in the comments below this very video. And after this video, I'll be looking at some of those comments and hopefully answering some of them on screen and the rest will make it into the show next week. So first up is from Jacob R. Hi Doddy, I'm currently on the fence of buying a new frame. It's a production privy Shan. That's a really nice hardtail by the way. I mean, they do make a full suspension model as well, but I think the regular Shan is the hardtail one. Um, I'm torn between getting it in a large or an extra large. I'm 182 centimeters. What's that in, what, five, nine, five, ten, something like that, I guess, about Neil's height, I think. Um, so by their chart, the size large frame should fit me perfect. Um, they say between riders of 178 and 188, yeah, cool. I'm not sure if the 432 millimeters of reach, 618 mil of stack, and the 1169 wheelbase will be too short for me compared to the 454 reach um, that the XL is offering. I plan to use it for afternoon rides or climbs on them, but also to have fun in a bike park. Um, to be honest, I think the large sounds all right. It doesn't sound overly big, but it sounds about right for your height. So Neil's about 5'10 and Blake's about 5'8, but they both have differing bikes. So Neil rides a size medium in a Scott Genius, which is 439 millimeter reach. Uh, that's in the 27 and a half inch mode. And 445 in the 29 inch wheel mode, which is the way he runs it. Blake though, interestingly, he's two inches shorter than Neil at 5'8, even though the, the long lasting joke says that Neil's shorter. He rides a size large and he runs it in a 466 mil, so that's the 27 and a half inch. So to be honest, mate, I think it's kind of up to you the way you want to figure this out. You know, it's not uncommon now for people to size up to get the most of a longer bike. And I actually encouraged Blake to try the longer bike because I thought the Scott wasn't especially long in that medium. And he certainly loves it in the large, but obviously he's kept the medium on the Nukeproof Mega. I mean, their large is a lot larger compared to the 435, I think it's, uh, yes, we're talking like 470 or something like that, which is nearer to an XL and a Canyon, which is about 480. So it just goes to show you do have to chop and change between brands to get that, but just go with what feels right to you. Their recommendations are generally a pretty good sort of basis for that. Really, I would suggest going for the large if you can, but just take into account the length of the seat tube. And obviously the, the saddle height you have, take into account what sort of dropper post you want on there. Dropper posts typically come up to about 170 mil of drop now, so make sure you add on the, the height of the collar, so you're talking about 30 mil for that, plus your clamp between the saddle and the frame, and then kind of work it out from there. But I reckon the large are probably all right on that frame. Next up is from Amundsen Kalmar. Currently, I'm running 38 mil internal rims. Uh, that's pretty wide. Um, okay, so they're on your plus bike with three inch tires. I want to run some skinnier tires. Do you think I can get away with 2.6 or is the 2.8 a better choice? Uh, going 29 is also an option. Thanks and enjoy the show. Okay, so firstly, you pick up on the 29er thing. By all means, try 29 inch wheels in a plus size bike, but bear in mind that a 29 inch wheel is still bigger than a plus size with a three inch tire. A few years ago, everyone thought they were about the same. They're not, a 29 is still bigger. So although they will fit in your fork and they will fit in the frame, unless your frame has any sort of method of changing the geometry, you are going to bump up your bottom bracket height quite significantly. So I probably wouldn't do that if I was you. And in relation to the tires, going down to 2.6, you could do that, but it will lower your bottom bracket. Now it all depends on the type of rider you are. I'd be more inclined to stick to the 2.8 because you know it's not gonna to be too far different and it's pretty much the size that most the bike industry has settled on with plus size tires. They found it gives the best combination of that sort of rollover ability of the plus size tires, but also the casing is a bit sturdier. With the three inch is a bit more wallowy, but not quite as good as it would be with a true fat bike like a 4.8 or whatever the fat bike sizes go up to. So I'd probably go for the 2.8. However, if you do really like a low BB and you don't mind clipping your feet on rocks or you're happy to adjust your riding style, a 2.6 could slam your bike down quite a lot and make it corner like it's on rails. Of course, that might not suit you or your trails. So 2.8 really is your sort of happy ground there. So good luck with that. From Phil Mean, 
Did anyone else think that in the clips of the women's XC race at 12.55 that their bikes looked awkwardly too big for them? The big wheels combined with the widest bars made obstacles were not really that large look awkward for them. Maybe I'm just stuck in 2005 or have been watching too much Hardline. Um, no, I, I, I didn't find that, but I think I know what you mean though. Um, and I only say that because I referred to Emily Batty quite a lot in that video. And just from what I know of speaking to her mechanic about her preferences, she's tried the 29 inch wheel thing and whilst they are fast and she could obviously ride them quite well, she prefers the fact that a 27 and a half inch wheel bike, considering she rides a size small, so it's a really, really small little frame, she finds it's easier to maneuver that bike around. And if you watch her riding through that pickup stick section, I think she looks really good in it. Perhaps a little better than some of the other girls that are running those. 29 inch wheel bikes. You've got to bear in mind as well, so the 29 inch wheel bike, it does offer the riders the ability, if they are sort of a smaller rider, they're going to suffer with things like the stroke of their arms, because their arms are simply smaller, in order to get over the bike. So that's where they can look a bit awkward. However, the wheel size does counter that and does give them that rollover effect. I think it kind of goes both ways. It does depend on the style of rider. I wouldn't say awkward, but perhaps the size of the wheels are enhanced by the fact that some of those women are quite short. I think that's probably the fairest way of saying it. What do you guys think, actually? Let us know down below. Do you think that's all, sort of, it looks strange that they're riding the 29 inch wheels? Next up from Deep Diver 49. You're a font of knowledge, Doddy. Well, thank you. I um, uh, don't really know what to say to that. Um, I'd call myself a geek, to be honest, but that's all good. Um, I find after a few hours, I start getting pins and needles in my feet. In your experience, is this caused by a twist of saddle, pedal, or my 53-year-old body reminding me I'm not so young anymore? Um, to be honest, I've never suffered from pins and needles. I've had numb toes before, and I've had this for a few different things. So in the winter, when you tend to run slightly thicker socks, obviously it cuts off your circulation a bit because you've got to stuff all your feet into those shoes. And I've also had it before with shoes that have just been a little bit tight around the toe box, so it puts a bit of pressure on your foot. I've not had it from bad position on the saddle, which I guess you could get. Um, but more than likely is how tight your shoes are actually on your feet. I think that has a significant effect. And I think on numbness and also for pins and needles, which suggests your feet aren't getting enough circulation if that sort of thing is happening. Now, I have heard of a foot condition called neuroma, which is often seen in long distance athletes, especially cyclists. So I would speak to a GP about this in case it is a concern of yours, but I did just look it up online. And basically this is what it says. Uh, neuroma is essentially a nerve fiber in the foot that's become inflamed and irritated, which sounds like it could be. The main symptom is pins and needles in the foot that can affect some of the toes and may progress into some minor numbness. Medical treatment includes injections, anti-inflammatories, um, and orthopedic inputs. Um, it's essential to see a, a GP with a special interest in foot problems to identify this. So yeah, um, firstly, I would suggest just make sure your shoes aren't too tight. Make sure you wear thin cycling shoes, not anything that's overly padded, uh, which I'm sure you probably are though, judging by the fact that you're 53, you've probably been riding quite a few years. Um, if not, check with your GP and find out what that is, because you want to get that seen to. Next up is from Max McAllister. Hey Doddy, just wondering in a video at some point if you could cover pull shocks. I'm really interested to see why Cannondale decided to run these a few years back and how they differ from the more, conve uh, more conventional push shock. There's been a whole bunch of different designs over the years and some of the more famous ones include the GT Lobo, which is a four bar downhill bike and it had a pull shock located behind the seat tube and just above the bottom bracket. Now, Pull shocks were conventionally used in areas where they wanted to put the shock in a specific place to make the suspension work, and they basically were restricted so they couldn't use a shock that compresses. Now, the early pull shocks, this particular one is on the GT that you can see on screen, made by RockShox, and whilst they did work very well, they also did suffer from problems of leakage and minor sort of reliability issues. Now, Schwinn and Yeti also had pull shock bikes. They had the straight eight and the straight six and a four banger, but I don't think the four banger had that shock on. They later got rid of the pull shock and used a regular compression shock for the same reason. The initial design was a great way of making it work, but they changed that design of the bike in order to put a conventional shock on there, basically. Another one to mention, actually, just before we go in there, is the Scott Genius. So the Scott Genius that we're running at the moment has their twin lock system on there, but it's got a conventional Fox shock, which is what they've settled on now because it's a very easily serviceable part Previously, they had their own equaliser shock, 
which was a twin tube chamber design, and that was a pull shock system, which although it did work very well, was also prone to problems, much like the Cannondale system with the dyad shock made by Fox. The dyad shock actually, from my point of view, was really interesting because it was essentially two shocks in one, a short travel shock and a long travel or full travel shock. You could switch between the two. So really, really good shock and it did work well, but obviously it didn't work quite well enough because Cannondale now have gone back to using a conventional shock design. What I can think, because I didn't really hear of any reliability issues with that dyad shock, I can only presume that people were put off by buying a bike because of that shock. Now, it wasn't because of how the shock felt. It would have been more because of the concerns of if something goes wrong with that shock when you're out on the trail. You've got to think that your conventional rock shocks or fox shocks that you see out there, they're easily serviceable by a number of bike shops anywhere you ride. A pull shock requires a lot of specialist tools and specialist spare parts. So. I'm guessing that's probably the reason that we don't see so many of them these days. I'll do a bit more research on that though and look into it and maybe we'll try and get one on the tech show at some point because they're quite interesting to look at and we'll try and get one of those retro bikes. So if you know anyone out there that's got a Schwinn or a Yeti in particular with those shocks on, love to see them so we can have a look at them. Send them in. Uh, next up is from Jared Looker. Hi Doddy, my headset was drying up so I went back and watched your headset maintenance video. The headset's an Atcross Block Lock, and it's in my 2018 Strive, uh, Canyon Strive Cool. Uh, it was easy enough until the top bearing in the headset couldn't be removed. I tried tapping lightly from the inside uh, with a soft piece of wood, but it wouldn't budge. Should this have come out, or is it a one-piece system? Um, I did manage to do a quick fix by removing the top seal and putting some extra grease in there. Uh, not sure how long that will last. Um, the bearing just sits in a frame, as far as I remember with that one, kind of like that Santa Cruz just there and like my Canyon. Um, the bearing should just sit into it. It should not be stuck in there. It definitely does come out of that frame. So it sounds to me like you may have, it may be dry fitted in there, something like that. So in which case it's stuck in place. So you want to tap it out like you've been doing it. You've been doing it right with a soft piece of wood so it won't damage the bearing, or more importantly, it won't damage the frame. But you need to tap it all the way around to make sure that force is pushing the bearing straight out. Because it's quite a precision fit when you have a bearing that sits into a frame, if you're tapping it on one side, you're actually probably making it a tighter fit in there. So you've got to consistently knock it all the way around and you will find it will come out and probably fire across your workshop or your kitchen. So it's good idea to put a towel or something over the top of that just to catch it when that does so. So just take care and that should knock itself out. Worst case, I think, as long as you're careful, you might damage the bearing, in which case it's not an expensive part to, to replace, so that's okay. Just take care to not damage your frame. And when you do put the bearing back in, if it's okay, or the new bearing, when you do put it back in, make sure you've got a sufficient amount of grease on there so it doesn't happen again. Okay, so last question this week is from Gordon Martinez. Hi Doddy, thanks a lot for the channel. Thanks for watching and subscribing, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm always learning something and keeping up with the current trends, thanks to you. Keep up the good work. Now for my question. I come from a BMX background, but fell in love with the big bikes because of how easy it is to cover a lot of ground and go and get lost somewhere. I'm looking into dropper posts for my heart out and I'm worried I might not be able to slam it far enough down in the frame. Because of my BMX background, I still like to huck off things and hit jumps and just abuse the bike in general. So I really want my saddle down, I want it to be non-existent. Have you guys had any trouble with that in the past? Um, yeah, actually, I've, I've had loads of problems with that, but mainly because I'm tall. So these days, you can get dropper posts up to 170 mil of drop, so it's less of a problem. When they first came out, they had like 75 mil drop, the early ones, and I still obviously had to slam the saddle down because being tall, it's, it's not as relative as a shorter person with the same amount of drop. So you can get the RockShox Reverb at 170, you can get the Crank Brothers Highline at 160, and most other sort of the big brands out there do 150 mil drop posts but there is a post out there that you might like the sound of. Now I had to go back into one of my old videos to remember the name of this. It's by, it's by KS, so that's kind shot, and it's called the Speed Up, and it does 250 millimeters of drop, right? So it is a little bit different to your normal dropper post. So the regular dropper posts have got air inside them, and the purpose of that is to raise the post after you've dropped it. Now this particular one doesn't, it's just a hydraulic post. And the idea of it is was developed for higher bikes and stuff like that, where you just have it fitted in the frame and you've just got infinite adjustment for whatever height rider wants to ride the bike. However, they're dirt cheap. They're about $80, I think, something like that, or about 80 quid in the UK. So really, really cheap. Now, again, 250 mil drop. It's got the lever under the saddle, so you just compress it and lower it. You obviously, you have to pull it back up again, 
but it does mean you get a bike with 250 mil drop. So on a hardtail frame, you could slam that saddle all the way in. Kind of surprised more people haven't started adopting these. I told Blake about it earlier actually, and he's like, be perfect for a jump bike. And I was like, well, that's exactly what I was thinking. So hopefully, um, it'd be a good one for you. Check out this video clip of me from Eurobike last year where I have a look at that very post. You might be sold on it. So KS, for example, they've been doing dropper posts for years, one of the first major manufacturers of them. They're now offering this post. It's got 250 mil drop. Laugh it up, but this has actually got really good ideas. It's great to see this sort of stuff going down to mega cheap bikes. In future, I think all bikes will be coming with dropper posts. So there you go, there's another Ask GMBN Tech in a bag. Hopefully, managed to answer some questions and uncover a few bits and pieces you guys needed to know. Don't forget you can send your questions in the usual address, add them in the comments below. Make sure you use that Ask GMBN Tech hashtag when you email us, it makes it a lot easier to find all those questions. So for a couple more great videos, click down here to identify all those creaks and groans on your bike. Everyone has a creak or a groan or a click at some point, that's how you find it and hopefully solve it. Now for another video, click right down here on how to perfect your shifting. Now it's not just about the indexing of the gears, it's about all those little small things for your drivetrain or even cable length on the bike that can affect your shifting. So click down there, that's a great little video that one. As always, click on the globe to subscribe to the channel and share it around, tell all your mates about us. And of course, if you found this video helpful, give us a thumbs up.